You're watching 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Thank you so much for joining us, my friends. And this week we're on lesson number 12, the very last lesson of this quarter. And it's entitled Rewards of Faithfulness. And God indeed has been faithful to us. And we've been learning that all through this quarter. And it's just such a blessing to be a part of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel and to be joined by my brothers and sisters in Christ, whom I would like to introduce to you at this moment to my very direct left. Michelle Quinn. Oh, it's a joy to be here. My lesson is everlasting life. Amen. And next to you, we have Pastor John Lomaking. Mine is an amazing lesson, the New Jerusalem. Mm. Mm. Looking forward to that Excited one. Excited about it. <laughs> All right. Next to you is Pastor John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here. Wednesday is the settling of accounts. Mm. All right. Okay. And then last but not least, Mich. Jill Morricone. I almost said Miss Shelley Quinn, but you're Jill Morricone. I received Shelley as my sister. So a Thursday we look at eyes on the prize. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, my friends, we dare not dive into the Word of God or a study of His Word without first going to the Lord in prayer first. We certainly need prayer so that we can best express the powerful truths that we find in this lesson. So I'm going to ask Pastor John Danzi if you wouldn't mind having a prayer for us. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your incredible, amazing love. We pray that as we study this lesson, as we share of what you have given to us, that you will bless us with the Holy Spirit in such a way that every word will be a blessing to your children. We pray, Lord, for you to bless uh, everyone that joins us, wherever they may be, and may your Holy Spirit lead them to a closer walk with you. We ask you in holy, blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 There is no reward, prize, or any type of gift in this life that past, present, or future can even come to in comparison to what God has prepared for those who are faithful to Him. And that's what Lesson number 12 is bringing out in rewards of faithfulness. Our memory text comes from Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And I can't wait to hear those words come from the mouth of my master. That all of this life and all of its trials and tribulations and difficulties, challenges, the ups and the downs, uh, even the death, though it may be tough and though its sting may be strong, all of it will be worth hearing those words one day come from your master's mouth. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Sabbath afternoon's lesson brings out that though we can never earn salvation, the Bible uses the hope of reward as a motivation for faithful living as undeserving recipients of God's grace. For in the end, whatever we receive is always and only from God's grace. As David wrote in Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 11, and I've seen scripture songs about this, beautiful, powerful words. David writes, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. I love that. Those who are faithful to God and living steadfast for Him, they can look forward to a great reward. And the lesson goes on to say in various places the Bible talks about our rewards, what, are, what we are promised through Christ after the second coming and this terrible detour with sin is once and for all over and done. And so what is it that we can look forward to in regards to what we are promised and what assurance do we have of getting what we have been promised? Well, that's what 
what we're going to find out this week as we now transition into Sunday's lesson. And uh, man, it was just, just looking through this lesson and being able to study it. Uh, it was a blessing to be able to be reminded of the beautiful promises of God and the word of God in which we know God cannot lie. And when we look at these words and we read them and we comprehend them, we know that if God has spoken, what he has spoken and what he said will be done. And so Sunday's lesson begins with us looking at, at one of the verses that we've often heard of many times and we've often quoted many times and that comes from Hebrews chapter 11 that great faith chapter the faith hall of fame as some have put it Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 and it uh, is asking us a question what is it that this is really saying how do we how do we take this this verse and comprehend it within the context of the reward for faithfulness which is the title of Sunday's lesson, Reward for Faithfulness. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. Yeah. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Okay, I cannot emphasize that enough. You know, we live in a world where often people think faith is just simply mentally accepting that God exists, or that just simply mentally accepting that Jesus did indeed die on the cross years ago for their sins. And while that is certainly a part of the salvational plan that God has, that we must come to grips with our literal belief and understanding that yes, there really was a Jesus Christ, and He really did do a work that only he could do to redeem mankind. Uh, faith goes far and beyond just a mental acceptance because as we know, the Bible makes it very clear that even the devil believes and trembles. So faith is trusting. It's a deep trust. It's a deep believing and trusting in what God has said he will do. And just those last words there in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, faith is it, without faith, it is impossible to please God, but it goes on to say, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Of course, my mind went to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Anytime you think about faith, how can we have faith? How can we grow our faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have faith in God separate from his word. That's how it grows. That's how we learn. When we come to trust what God has said and that we believe in what he's going to do and that he's going to accomplish exactly what he says he's going to do in our lives and in this world and in the next, then that, that builds our faith in him him to be faithful servants of the Lord. Even Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 11 through 14 highlights the fact because what did it say at the end of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6? Those who diligently seek, seek him. There's something about faithfulness or growing your faith or establishing faith in diligently seeking the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 11 through 14, one of my favorite verses of all time. God proclaims a powerful promise and he says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. He says, stop telling me or, 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 or telling others what, what I should think about you because I know what I think about you. And what are those thoughts? He says, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And I love this. And you will seek me right. and find me. How? How will we seek him and find him? The answer comes in the next part. When you search for me with all your heart. And then the first part of verse 14, and I will be found by you. I love that God is not hiding from us. He's not set us in, in, a, in a crazy, uh, complicated maze and, and standing on the other end saying, woohoo, uh, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, come find me. No, no, no. It's not like that at all. God is there, but yet we must with all our heart, mind, and soul seek him diligently, put our full self into learning of his word and learning of his character. Revelation chapter 22, verses 12. Also Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. In fact, if I could get someone, uh, maybe Jill, if you want to read Revelation 22, verse 12. And then uh, Pastor Denzi, if you would like to read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. And then Pastor Loma King, if you could take Isaiah 62, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 11. So Jill, what does Revelation 22, verse 12 say? And behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Okay, so there's the promise again that he is returning with that reward and it's it's interesting because he's giving it based on our work. And I often read these texts and I think, wait a second, I thought it was based on our faith. Uh, well, we're saved by grace through faith, but yet the determination of that reward is based on our works. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, Pastor Denzi, what does it say? Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. 
Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Mm, so there it is again. Be behold, his reward is with him. God is returning with that reward. And we know we're living in a judgment time period right now in which God will determine who his faithful are. Are we the sheep? Are we the goats? Are we the wheat? Are we the tares? Are we those who love truth? Are we those who do not love truth? Are we fully surrendered or not? He's coming back with his reward. And of course, Pastor Loma King, Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 11. Verse 11, it says... Um, Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world. Say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. His reward is with him. These texts just establish the fact that God has promised that he will indeed reward those who are faithful. That's the whole point of this lesson is that each and, a, each and every one of us, even though we're going through these trials and difficulties in this life, it's not going to go unrewarded if we remain, remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and place our faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, it's a powerful uh, quote here from Ellen G. White, Great Controversy, page 670. I love this because again, it gives us just a, just a glimpse into the reality of what we're dealing with when, in regards to the reward that God has for us. Because it says here in Great Controversy, page 674, human language is inadequate mm. to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. You got to be there. You got to be there before you see it, before you can understand it. And he goes on to say, no finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is foundation. That quote, I know for a fact, comes from the truth that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, which reminds us that even though, and I do this often, I don't know about you guys, I find myself often just daydreaming. And sometimes I even dream about what God's paradise is going to be like, what it's going to be like when we are truly rewarded for our faithfulness. When we hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. What's it going to be like? What's those streets of gold going to be like? What's the gates of pearl going to be like? What's all of these powerful things? But ultimately, what is Jesus going to be like in Amen. person? We're going to look Amen. upon his face. <laughs> We're going to be in his presence. And it's powerful because what is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 saying? It says, you know what? You can think about it all day long. You can try to daydream about it and dream about it all day long. But it says, it is, it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's right. Do you love your Lord? Because it all comes down to the fact that you know, we might go through trials. We might go through troubles in this lifetime. But do you love him to persevere through those, mm -hmm. to receive your reward? Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12, blessed are, they, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you mm -hmm. and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, though, he says, for great is your reward in heaven, mm -hmm. for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yes, we may have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death in this life. But Jesus says, if you remain faithful to me and place your life, your house upon the rock of Jesus Christ, you will be rewarded greatly in the next. Hey, Amen. Man, thank you for that foundation. What an exciting topic, the reward for the faithful. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Monday and it is everlasting life. It just occurred to me. Let me explain very quickly. The word everlasting or eternal in the Bible, aeonius in the Greek, it is a relative term. In other words, it derives its meaning from who it is describing. So when we talk about God, because he is immortal because he does live forever. When we mention everlasting life with God, anything that's everlasting or eternal, in reference to God, it means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever without end. <clears throat> if we use everlasting in reference to a man or something that a city or something that's got a finite period of time, it just means until it's used up. Does that make sense? Did yeah. I do? Okay. Listen, listen to what our adult Bible study guide says. It starts off and says, as human beings, whether we like it or not, an eternity awaits us. And according to the Bible, this eternity will come in one of two manifestations, 
at least for each of us individually. So here's the two choices, the two manifestations, either eternal life or eternal death. That's it. No middle ground, no straddling, a bit of one side or another. Instead, it is one or the other, life or death. This truly is a case of all or nothing. Now, let me give you one more little English lesson. I believe in using simple language, but sometimes there's just a word that it, it's so meaningful. I want to, if you don't know this word, let me teach you one of my favorite words, juxtaposition. Mm. Juxta means that it's near and position is how it's posed, right? So juxtaposition. That word, if you juxtapose something or juxtaposition of something, it means that you have two totally contrasting ideas. They couldn't be more different than daylight and darkness that are positioned in a statement. So I say that because what we're getting ready to read, if you've got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3. What we find in John chapter 3 Jesus is speaking with some juxtapositions. He's positioning one thing in stark contrast to something else that he mentions in the sentence. Mm -hmm. So John chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let's hit the pause button. That's not a juxtaposition. That's just a statement of the mm -hmm. rewards of God. God so loved the world. Our creator God, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Everything was created through him. And John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Our creator God humbled himself to become a man mm -hmm. and to become the covenant son of God. Only begotten means chosen for a covenant purpose, just as Isaac was the only begotten son of Abraham. So here we've got a demonstration of the intensity of God's love. When he looks at us and he wants to save us, that God would become a human being so that he can become our substitute and die for us to take our sin penalty. That is so amazing. And he came, Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. But now here's the juxtaposition of John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him... Now he's going to juxtapose two things. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. Those are totally, completely contrasting ideas. To perish, the word here means utter destruction That's right. in the Greek. Utter destruction. When he, God's not going to burn mortal human beings forever and ever and ever and ever in the lake of fire. There's an end to this. We're good. There'll be ashes, right? So he's saying you're either going to have eternal death. And we know it's, he's talking about the second death that Revelation mentions four times. You're either going to have eternal death or eternal life, depending mm -hmm. on what you do about the son. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on in verse 17. He says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now he's going to juxtapose a thought, but that the world through him might be saved. So it's not about condemnation. Jesus came to condemn sin, not sinners. He came to save the world. Revelation, excuse me, let's look at another juxtaposition, Romans 6. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Romans 6. And we're going to begin with verse 20. The, the Bible is full of juxtapositions. And now that you've got that idea in your mind, watch for it because it helps to define. We understand perishing is, is juxtaposed with eternal life. So it's talking about eternal death. But Romans 6, verse 20 says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. 
Huh. You didn't have to worry about righteousness when you were slaves of sin. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Mm -hmm. But here's the juxtaposition. Having been set free from sin and having becoming slaves of God, slaves of sin, mm -hmm. slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. So you didn't have any, you had fruit that you were ashamed of before. Now you've got fruit of holiness and the end everlasting life. But here's the big one. Juxtaposition, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So there's two inescapable absolutes right here. Either death, the second death of Revelation 2014 says, uh, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Okay. So here when he says the wages of sin is death or the gift of God is eternal life. Let's look at this. We're free. God gave us free will. What a gift. He did that because he loves us and he wants us to love him by choice. But we're free to choose our master, but you know what? We're not free to choose our consequences. Right. <laughs> there's, there's very, okay. the consequences are stated. So what he's saying is if you remain a slave to sin, you're in rebellion against God. You're rejecting his righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You get the wages you earn. The wages of sin is death second death, or by your decision, you can turn, listen to the God who is saying, turn, turn, why should you die? Turn to me. And then you get, what is it? The free gift. It's not wages. You cannot earn salvation. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn salvation. Even your obedience cannot earn you salvation. Jesus didn't obey to become the Son of God. He became, he obeyed because he was the Son of God. So there's nothing you can do. It's an undeserved gift of grace, but it's a gift of eternal life. Wages of death, gift of eternal life. Boy, there are not two more stark or distinct choices, are there? So here's the good news. Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. Mm -hmm. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again mm -hmm. and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I mm -hmm. pray that you make the choice to turn to God and receive all the rewards he has for his faithful. Mm. Amen. 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 I love those texts. You're not going to want to go anywhere, my friends, because when we come back in just a moment, we're going to be learning all about that precious, beautiful place that God has prepared for us. So don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it over to Pastor John Loma King for Tuesday's lesson. Yes, and mine is on the new Jerusalem, the reward of faithfulness. This to me is the ultimate reward. As Ryan pointed out earlier, uh, we have been wondering, Revelation has even given us a peek into what is to come, but truly eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. And Paul goes on to say, it hasn't even entered into our minds 
what God prepares for those that love him. You know, what you should do sometimes, which I've done before, is just pause and go out into the night light. Go in, the colder time of the year is better to do it because the skies tend to have this vividness, this yes. beauty that it doesn't have when it's hot and when it's smoggy and when it's raining. And just if you can, for about five or 10 minutes or so, just go to a field where it's completely dark, close your eyes, and maybe about a minute later, open your eyes. My wife and I did that a number of years ago when we lived up in the mountains of the Northern California mountains up in Trinity County. We pulled our car off at the highest point of the overpass, turned our lights off, laid on the hood, and the windshield was our pillow. And we leaned back there and counted to 60. And when we opened our eyes, it was like heaven was raining on us. Mm. And I thought to myself, wow, that's God's playground. Astronomers have assumed and have even speculated there are billions of galaxies and scientists have done their best to try to duplicate and even through sci-fi to just tweak our imagination, but they can't even do that because it hasn't even entered into the hearts of man, the things that God prepares for those that love him. But I can't wait as Abraham, Hebrews 11 verse 10 says, for he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And we've all been waiting. Sometimes I ask, Lord, what else needs to happen? Would you allow some catastrophe to occur? So just take the reins into your own hand and just wind this up. Let's get out of here. No more diseases, no more heartache, no more suffering. Because the New Jerusalem, as uh, Elder Ed Reed said, is God's masterpiece. Yes. Have you ever seen a gate made of one pearl? <laughs> I can't shit. fathom the oyster that came from. <laughs> Have you ever thought about a city with 12 foundations of precious stones and walls that are made of gold that are transparent glass. We haven't seen anything that even resembles that. My wife and I, uh, when we were in another country, and actually in Singapore, we went to the store Tiffany's to just look around because we were in this opulent mall. We don't wear adornments, we don't wear jewelry, but we said, you know, this mall is all about opulence. Let's see what that means. <laughs> I tell you, we were not the same for a couple of days. But that falls far short of what God is going to be able to do for those that love him. So I have, Jill, 10 applications, Ooh. 10 things. And I, it's all going to be based on Revelation chapter 21. So let's go to Revelation chapter 21 together and look at what God has even, even given, given us a glimpse of, kind of peek behind the curtain. We look through the peephole of eternity mm. and we see something glittering. And God says, I'll just let you know all that you can handle in your, in your mortality. One of the reasons I believe that we have to be immortal is because it's gonna overwhelm us so much that our immune system is gonna go into defect or breakdown. <laughs> We're gonna literally internally begin to melt when we see what God has in store for us. That's one of the reasons why we need to be immortal. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Don't ask for many of those, but at least we got one today. Revelation 21 verse one, let's look at this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. The first earth will be made new. The first heaven that passes away or the heaven that passes away is not where God is, but it's like the moon where we put our, where we put our, our uh, flag and the things that uh, uh, exist above the earth's atmosphere that were affected by the taint of sin. God is gonna redo all of that. And what's wonderful about that is it says there'll also be no more sea. Now, my brother's a fisherman and he had a hard time with that verse. That doesn't mean that there'll be no more water. It means that the things that separates humanity, you know, when the Bible talks about the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, that is the split that is caused by, by borders and in time zones and in lands and the oceans are the majority of earth that separates the waters from the waters. I mean, the people from the people, the land from the land, what in essence is being said there is there's nothing that's going to separate us. We're going to be in one harmonious whole mm -hmm. as God is going to be our God mm -hmm. and we were going to be his people. So the first earth will be made new. And boy, I can't wait to see Yos Yosemite untouched by sin. <laughs> what, a, what a sight that's going to be. Second one, the earth will be the resting place of the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verse 2. Then I, John, I love that saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is one of those passages that reminds us that even though the church has been often called the bride of Christ, in reality, the New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. Because when John says, I want to see the bride, and he says, and he showed me the lamb's wife, the New Jerusalem. So we are the guests at the wedding, the five wise and five foolish virgins. We are invited into this beautiful delivery of the kingdom to God, but what would a kingdom be without the people of God being That's right. in it? That's, right. That's the beauty of it. We're going to be at this glorious coronation of the ages. And man, we always talk about sitting down at the welcome table. They're going to be food that we never thought about. But more than the food, there's going to be the fellowship to be able to see Jesus and our heavenly father face to face. How beautiful that will be. Which brings me to verse three. We will be with God and he will be with us. Revelation 21 verse three. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Listen to this. He will dwell with them yes. and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. What a day of rejoicing that is going That's to right. be. When finite and infinite meet and infinite makes finite infinite. Yes. <laughs> I can't say that twice. When we put in, when we put on immortality, and God says, our fellowship will never end. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Wow. I just want to try to absorb that. Number four, Revelation 21, verse four. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Shelley, will you be glad that there'll be no more pain? Oh boy. <laughs> all those shoulders, all those backs, all those medications that people take, no more glasses, no more contact lenses, no more rickets and crickets and hydrophobia and claustrophobia, no more wheelchairs, no more emergency rooms. Yeah, right. Somebody stop me. Amen. The former things of sin will be permanently banished. Sorry, doctors, you will not be employed in heaven That's because right. God will make all things new, which brings me to verse five. Verse five of Revelation 21. What a glimpse. Then he sat, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. Elon Musk will be just like everybody else in heaven <laughs> because our transportation is going to be on the wings of God's grace. How beautiful our transportation. We're going to be floating on the waters of God's perfection and basking in the glory of God's grace. How beautiful that's going to be when every one of us will see that in this life, the greatest blessing we had in this finite world is to get to know the God that we will spend eternity with. Wow. How beautiful. Now let's go to verse six because it keeps going. It keeps going. Revelation 21 verse six. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give, I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirst. Wow. How many of us will be thirsty then? You know, I've discovered in our reading and our studying and even in the writings of Ellen White and the great controversy, you know, we will never stop learning. We will be amazed at one moment after the other. Can you imagine? I want to ask God how he made DNA. I just want to ask him, how did you hold it all together? The, 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 what do you call it? The laminin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that cross-like section that holds the human body together that if it did not exist, we'd fall apart mm -hmm. like just a piece of clay that had nothing connecting us to, like we had no scaffolding. How did you do it? How did you put oxygen and hydrogen in the blood and we did not explode. Mm -hmm. How did you put the earth just far enough away from the sun that we don't burn up or that we don't freeze? That's right. Amazing. And we'll get a chance to see everything made new. Let me go on because I have so much more in less than 49 seconds. We will inherit the things that God prepares for us. Revelation 21 verse seven, he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Number eight, all sin will be shut out of heaven. No possibility of sin. Revelation 21 verse eight, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, which is the second death. That's what's going to happen then. Number nine, faithfulness will be rewarded. Matthew 19 verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or, or, or mother or father or brother or sister for my sake shall receive a hundredfold in this life and inherit eternal life. And lastly, the greatest blessing will be Revelation 22 and verse four. We shall see his face. Amen. I'm looking forward 
to that day. Amen. 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 Well, before that, yes. <laughs> we have to consider some things that are written in the scriptures concerning before the New Jerusalem. Uh, and I, uh, I said to myself, man, we should have closed with that. <laughs> but here on Wednesday's portion, uh, portion, my name is John Dinsey, uh, talking about the settling of accounts. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, and uh, they were there and looking at the temple in Jerusalem, the disciples asked Jesus, uh, told Jesus, look at these beautiful uh, buildings. And Jesus said, do you see all these things? And then he had to uh, let them know that this was going to be nothing. It's gonna, there's not going to be one stone upon another. And so they want to know, when shall these things be? So Matthew 24 uh, takes you into signs that precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. But the focus of uh, this portion of the lesson Wednesday is uh, one of the parable, parables found in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, before this parable, you have the parable of the ten virgins, mm -hmm. the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. And this uh, assignment <laughs> starts with the parable of the ten talents. But I want to read the verse just before that because it lets us, it sets a stage for uh, this parable. It says, uh, Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the parable of the ten talents, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his, delivered his goods to them. Mm. So let's consider that this man that went to a far country is Jesus. But notice what happens. He delivers his goods to them. And in the parable of the ten talents, uh, really it's talking about money in a sense because Notice how they use it and notice that the word bank is used mm -hmm. later on in the parable. And the, uh, this man gave his goods to them. They belonged to him, but he put them in their hands to use wisely. Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability and immediately he went on a journey. You and I uh, are blessed according to the ability that we have and according to the faithfulness with which we deal with what God gives to us, according to our ability. And that's why some give five, some give four, etc. Now let's go into verse 17. And likewise, he, um, uh, actually verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents, 100% increase. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also, 100% increase. But what should we expect from the person that received one? We should expect 100% increase. But this is not what takes place. And it says in verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug into the ground and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Hmm. And this is where the mistake takes place. It says in verse 19, After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. What will it be for you when the Lord says, Come, let us settle accounts. Mm -hmm. How you have handled the things that God has given you, your children, your possessions, and the money that He's put into your hands, into your trust to use wisely, surely for your family to take care of the needs of your home, but beyond the needs of your home, the cause of God has needs. Yeah. And you often hear in churches, we have this project, mm -hmm. or oh, we are going to do an evangelistic campaign. How do you react? Do you respond according to the way the Lord has blessed you? Or are you, uh -uh, this, uh, this is for us. Mm -hmm. This is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, so the Lord is going to settle accounts with us. And this is a serious thing to consider. Now, this parable is talking to us about something that was common in those days. When a, a, an owner gave things to his servants, he expected to have the time to settle accounts with them. And you can see that some of them were afraid to see how he was going to respond. But let's go ahead and uh, read some of the things that took place. 
Matthew 25, verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. Wonderful response. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What great news to hear. What great news to hear. I would like to read to you from uh, uh, Testimonies, Volume 1, 539. Very important message here. It says, If men fail to render to God that which He has lent them to use for His glory and thus rob Him, they will make an entire failure. He has lent them means which they can improve upon by losing no opportunity to do good, and thus they may be constantly laying up treasure in heaven. And this is what we can do. Put them to the good use of the Lord's work. Mm -hmm. This is what God is expecting of us. So verse 22 of Matthew 25 says, He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And again, wonderful things uh, that he hears. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well, what do you think the person with one talent would be thinking at this point? Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to be for me, but he, he presents his case. Uh, let's go ahead and go to... Um, Matthew chapter 25, verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. He oh. really did nothing with it. Mm. Yeah. It would have been just as well for the owner to keep that one talent in his possession. Mm -hmm. But he gave it to him so that he can do something with it. And this is why you have verse 26. But, the, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even that which he has will be taken away. Mm -hmm. And cast that unprofitable servant into the outer darkness." There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is something that you also see repeated in the book of Revelation. People who weep and gnash their teeth because they realize what they have lost. Yeah. This servant did not hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes we look at this uh, parable and because the word talent is used, we consider talent like uh, singing, preaching, or some other talent. But in Colossians chapter 331, uh, actually, yeah, 331. Christ Object Lesson. Christ Object Lesson 331. Thank you very much. Uh, this is interesting. <laughs> uh, concern <laughs> Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, uh, it says something very important, uh, even for the people that receive five, two, or one many whom God has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little mm. because they attempt little. Mm. Isn't that something? Wow. You accomplish little because you attempt little. Opportunities are presented before you to do something for the Lord, but nothing happens because you attempt nothing. Mm. Thousands pass through life as if they had no definite object for which to live no standard to reach. Such will obtain a reward proportionate to their works. And this is what will take place. 
wow, time, uh, time is passing by quickly. So I, I encourage you to consider uh, the words that you will hear. Will you hear the same thing that happened to the person with one talent, or will you hear the words of those that receive five or two? I want to encourage you to work for the Lord and do with what the Lord has given you so that you will hear the words, well done, mm -hmm. thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Those will be uh, words that are sweet music to your ears. Amen, amen, amen. What an incredible study. Thank you all so much. Can't believe we're on lesson 12, the last lesson of the oh. quarter. I'm Jill Morconi. I have Thursday, which is eyes on the prize. And that prize is what Pastor John talked about. Seeing the face of Jesus, spending eternity in the new Jerusalem. And uh, what an incredible day that will be. Amen. But what do we do in this world we're in now? this world of sin and sickness and suffering and tribulation. How do we endure and how do we keep our eyes on the prize? There's a New Testament hero of faith. He's actually my favorite New Testament author. It's Paul. He wrote 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. How did he endure? When he gave his life to Christ after that Damascus Road experience and he accepted Jesus as his Messiah and he began to proclaim that. Did he have a bed of roses? Did he have an easy life? Absolutely not. What did he endure for the gospel? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We pick it up in verse 24. 2 Corinthians 11, 24. Paul speaking from the Jews. Five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Now 40 stripes was the maximum number of stripes allowed under Jewish law. Sometimes they say the lash cut so deeply that the spine was exposed, or even the bowels came out severe. 40 times, five times he received the lash, 39 times. Then we go to verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. This would be by the Roman magistrates. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. How in the world does Paul keep his eyes on the prize? In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Verse 27, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. When I read that list, I say, Jill, you've encountered nothing. Hmm. The trials, the things I've experienced that I think, oh, wow, God, this is a taxing burden. I've experienced nothing compared to this. You look at the early Christian church and the problems that they encountered. Paul, we know eventually he endured all this, but eventually he was beheaded for his faith. Peter was crucified upside down. John was boiled in a vat of oil. James was beheaded. How did they endure? How did they endure these trials and persecutions? How did they keep their eyes on the prize? We have seven keys for you and I today to enduring our own trials or our own persecution. I know right now, some of you, we just heard here at 3ABN, someone called in from China, China. And right now, some of you are enduring persecution for the gospel. Here we can worship freely and we think we have certain trials and we do, but some of you are enduring persecution. How can we endure with our eyes on the prize? Let's look at those keys. Key number one, you might not even think is a key to enduring, but let's look at it. Understand who you are in Christ. Go with me to Romans chapter eight. You say, I don't think Pastor Johnny at all understanding who I am in Christ is going to help. But look at this, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is who we are in Christ. And if children, then heirs, that's who we are in Christ. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, 
that we may also be glorified together. You see, we can only suffer with him or we can only not deny him when persecution comes if we understand that we're children of God, if we understand that we are heirs with Christ and joint heirs with him in Christ if we understand who we are in Christ, it impacts our faithfulness. It impacts our fidelity. It impacts our love and commitment. It impacts our outlook on life, how we treat other people and how we endure under trials and persecution. If I ever forget who I am in Christ, I go to Ephesians chapter one, Shelley, and I read that again. And I discover in Christ, I'm blessed and chosen and holy. In Christ, I'm adopted and accepted and redeemed and sealed. So if you ever wonder who you are, go to Ephesians 1 and you'll discover who you are in Christ. Key number two for enduring those trials and persecution is to compare today's trial with eternity. Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Today's trial is nothing compared to the glory of eternity. Mm -hmm. right. We also see 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says really the same thing. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, faith, it demands an eternal perspective. And what I go through here is preparing me for that life of eternity with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number three, we're going to Philippians for this one. Number three, forget what is behind. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So let's stop just a moment. What things are we to forget? We're to forget our trials here on this earth. We're to forget the defeats that we have had. And I also think we're to forget our victories. We forget all of that. And what do we do? This is key number four. We press toward the prize. Continue reading in Philippians 3 verse 14. We forget those things which are behind and we reach forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, what is that? Of course, that's perfection of character. That's our sanctification process, but it is also the eternal reward that God promises for you and for me. What is the prize of the Christian? Is it eternal life? Absolutely. Is it salvation by grace through faith? Absolutely. What a gift. Keep your eyes on the prize. Key number five, experience the love of Christ. We're going back to Romans. Romans chapter eight, verses 35 through 37. Experience the love of Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Who should separate us from the love of Christ when trial comes upon you? You know, in the days of Jesus, the Jews believed that suffering was a curse from God because of a punishment for sin. But yet when trial comes upon you, know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Know that this trial is not a curse that it is the result of the world of sin we live in. But yet in the midst of this, God is working out in a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And he's perfecting his character in you and in me. And that nothing, no pain, no suffering, no sorrow can separate us from the love of Jesus. Key number six, depend on Jesus. Second Corinthians 12 verse 10. Paul speaking, therefore I take pleasure. Woo! I embrace those infirmities, those reproaches in needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Mm -hmm. 
when I'm weak is when we need to be most dependent yes. on Christ. Are you in the midst of a trial and persecution? Depend on Jesus. Finally, key number seven, expect it. Expect those trials and persecutions because they will come. Second Timothy 3, 11 and 12. Persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me and Paul lists the cities. These persecutions I endured. Out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We are no better than our master. And our master, the Lord Jesus, clearly suffered persecution. So know that no matter what you are going through, God will be with you and you can keep your eyes on the prize and that's an eternity with Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Jill. For that, let's get some final thoughts from our panel members. I'm just thinking that Jesus promised he had gone on to prepare a place for us. And if he died for us, we can be assured he's coming back for us. And he says to receive you to myself because he wants us to be where he is. Amen. The same new Jerusalem that John talked about is the same new Jerusalem that John is waiting for. Mm. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I say all, me too. <laughs> Well, Psalm 116, verse 12 has a question that I want to leave you with. Consider this and act upon it. What shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits toward me? Amen. Thursday, we looked at keep your eyes on the prize, and it's so easy to look around. It's so easy to look at other people. It's so easy to look at maybe a trial or something that you're going through or enduring. But just turn your eyes from all of that and focus on Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys so much for such a powerful lesson study. Some of the, my favorite words from my favorite hymn, the Never Part Again, says, Could we but stand where Moses stood and view the landscape o'er? Not all this world's pretended good could ever charm us more. I love that. If we could only see a glimpse it is said that we would truly surrender our life because the reward would so be worth it. My friends, thank you so much for joining us for this quarter. That's it. This is the end of this quarter. Next week, we're going to be starting a brand new quarter lesson. And I'm excited because quarter number two, we're going to be studying a lesson. In, or our lesson study is entitled Three Cosmic Messages. We're going to be learning all about the Three Angels messages right here on the Three Angels Broadcasting Network on your favorite program, 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.